My wife came home. I said at the door, I said, hey, good news. President and Mrs. Carter are coming. And she started to go up the stairs and she said, that's really nice. We'll be able to see them. And she got about halfway up the stairs and she turned, waved her finger at me and she said, you better not have asked them to sleep here. From NCPR, welcome to Northwards. People, ideas and conversations from and about Northern New York, Vermont and beyond. I'm Mitch Tyke. Support for the Northwards podcast comes from the J.C. Steiniger and M.E. McDonald Charitable Fund at Adirondack Foundation in support of the Adirondack Foundation, building stronger Adirondack communities. I can tell you exactly where I was in 1981 when the word came down that the U.S. hostages in Iran were released. I was at sixth grade camp. It was a chilly January morning in Virginia. I was doing KP duty when suddenly the camp bell rang out to celebrate the hostages' freedom as they were greeted by outgoing President Jimmy Carter. Carter celebrated his 100th birthday at home in Georgia this month. He's lived longer than any U.S. president in history and amassed a legacy that means much to many different kinds of people. Some remember his work on the Middle East peace process. Others think back on the complex challenges he faced with the Iran hostage crisis and stubborn inflation. And still others think of the public service and charitable work that he and his wife Rosalind, who passed away last year, did in the four decades since they left the White House. While Arthur Milnes remembers those things too, the memory that rises to the surface for him is the night the president stayed in his house in Kingston, Ontario. Milnes is a historian, archivist, tour guide, speech writer, and author of a book that came out two and a half years ago ahead of Carter's 98th birthday called 98 Reasons to Thank Jimmy Carter. On this episode of Northwards, we revisit our conversation with Arthur Milnes from March of 2022. Thanks for being with us. Just thrilled to talk to our American friends and neighbors. How does a man from Kingston, Ontario, even one who has been a historian and speech writer, get to know the 39th president of the United States? Oh, boy. Do you have a week? <laughs> <laughs> my, my journey with Jimmy Carter starts when I'm about 14. And my parents, my mother in particular, never discussed politics around the dinner table with one exception, and that was Jimmy Carter. She thought, from a Canadian standpoint, that Jimmy Carter was simply the greatest American president there could be. And both her and my father felt that with him in the White House, they at the height of the Cold War, they felt very safe with his finger on the deterrent button. And uh, I guess that's where it started. And for whatever reason, I remember buying his uh, uh, his memoirs, uh, Keeping Faith, when I was about 17. And then I wrote to him and I got a handwritten note back. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, I was quite thrilled. And as uh, my career moved on into uh, journalism, I always kept up on his activities. And then um I don't know, 20 years ago, I read an article in the New York Times on a Sunday that President Carter taught Sunday school and it was open to the public. And I just half an hour later, I had a plane ticket to go to Atlanta out of Syracuse and I drove to planes uh, from Atlanta and went to his uh, Sunday school service and you get to meet him uh, after. So I went up and I said, hi, I'm here from Canada. And he seemed very intrigued by that. And uh, we chatted for a few minutes, and and then I went a year later, and uh, this time I said, "Hey, can we? Can I do an interview about Canada? Nothing else, right?" And he said, "Yeah." I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, "Yeah, let's go to lunch." So off we went to the only restaurant in Plains at the time called Mom's Kitchen, and the former president of the United States and myself lined up at the buffet like everybody else. And uh, he made me pay. I, he still owes me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the short version. Wow. Know, so. uh, he, he was a one-term president and not a very popular one in this country when he left office. Uh, it was obviously a tough time for the country, but it, history seems like it treats Jimmy Carter today more like your parents' opinion of him. Oh, uh, totally. And um, what I found wonderful to watch 
is the fact that President Carter and, and Mrs. Carter have lived so long that they've been able to witness these reappraisals. And if you want to get Jimmy Carter mad, tell him he's a great ex-president. He hates that. He feels that the projects he's worked on as an ex-president are in a way a continuation of his presidency. And that, so it's fascinating. But I can tell you a funny story, if you want. Uh, when um, President and Mrs. Carter uh, honored my wife and I, they slept over here at our house in Kingston. And at dinner, we were talking. And I said, you know, Mr. President, you remind me of Herbert Hoover. And he looked at me and he said, I don't hear that one, often, <laughs> Arthur. And I said, well, I told him this story, a uh, famous story that at the end of Hoover's life, one term lived decades after the presidency, people started to gain a new respect for Hoover. And um, a reporter or somebody asked Hoover, what's your secret? that all these people now from these groups now respect you. And without hesitating, old President Hoover, Herbert Hoover said, I outlived the bastards. That's my <laughs> secret. And I've seen Jimmy Carter smile before. That was the biggest smile I ever seen on his face. <laughs> was that one. Well, I, and, and I, I'm curious because, as you say, he he stayed over at your house along with his Secret Service detail and, and you know, whatever entourage uh, a former president has to have with him. What does one have to do to get one's house ready for a former president to, to, to have a sleepover? Well, I'll tell you a funny story. When um, the university here offered to present them with honorary degrees, a joint degree, which is great because it's pretty hard. Another thing I love about uh, the Carters is it's tough to tell where Jimmy starts and Rosalind ends and, and vice versa. Their partnership should be their middle name. So the day it was confirmed, uh, I was at home and my wife came home from work. And um, I said at the door, I said, hey, good news, President and Mrs. Carter are coming. And she started to go up the stairs and she said, that's really nice. We'll be able to see them. And she got about halfway up the stairs and she turned and she waved her finger at me and she said, you better not have asked them to sleep here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I said, well, it came up. <laughs> right? so, so to answer your question. Uh, you clean a lot. <laughs> and uh, my dream was probably like most men. My dream was to cook steaks on the barbecue and me and the president, my hero, the former president of the United States, having beers, grilling steaks. And my wife just said, no. She said, you'll burn everything. You'll run out of gas. And she was totally correct. So uh, we ended up having the meal uh, catered. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to yeah, have so, to send the former president down to the store to buy more propane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And you know what he would have. Right. But uh, yeah, it was quite a, an experience. And my neighbors loved it. And uh, something my wife and I treasure is that President and Mrs. Carter both planted ceremonial trees in our garden. And uh, uh, I proudly plaque them. And uh, I've also had seven prime ministers of Canada drop over. So I have quite a garden. This, this book is not a political analysis and, and no. not exactly history. Why, why was it important to write this tribute to him? You know, he's 98 or he will be uh, this year. And I was impacted by uh, there's two recent full length biographies of him by top U.S. journalists, historians, wonderful books. But I was also thinking a lot of my friends who aren't big political history fans, they've been talking about him a lot because of, you know, the documentaries, Carter Land. And then there was the one that really got people interested was um, Rock and Roll President. So I thought to myself, you know, um, why don't I not do a, you know, deep dive look at the Carter legacy, because, you know, um, I've done that in the past. But I thought, why don't I have some fun? And I wrote it in a light vein. I call it, if I'm allowed to say on the air, I call it a bathroom book. So you go to the bathroom, you take the book, it's perfect small size, and 
you read three or four things. And then if you're at work, you go to the water cooler and you say, did you know that Elvis made one of his last phone calls to Jimmy Carter? <laughs> right? Or did you know that Jimmy Carter helped save the capital of Canada uh, from a nuclear accident? Because his, do you know Jimmy Carter makes his own wine, right? <laughs> like his Carter's legacy and interests are so eclectic. And then obviously there were serious things. Um, for a one-term president, his foreign policy successes are remarkable. Uh, obviously Camp David, the Panama Canal, uh, negotiating a nuclear agreement with the Soviets that wasn't approved by Congress, but they abided by it. These were giant accomplishments. And uh, so I put those in as well. Well, and, and I think there may be many people who forget or or who are not old enough to remember um, Canada's positive role in the major foreign policy crisis of the Carter administration, uh, the, the hostage crisis. When he came here to Kingston, uh, he, he told me before, a week or two before, that he was going to see the movie Argo on purpose in Atlanta ahead of his Canadian trip. So he might have been out of politics 40 years. <laughs> Boy, did he know how to make a Canadian crowd happy. And he, in his speech, he talked about how Ben Affleck's movie was a great movie, except he thought that Canada was undersold and the Canadians were the true heroes. And uh, that went over pretty well for some reason. <laughs> For knowing as much as you know about the Carter presidency and, and about Jimmy Carter, the man, were there aspects of his life that when you were putting this book together still surprised you? Oh, daily. Uh, I had no idea he played such a crucial role. You're ready for this in sparking the American craft brewing industry. I had no idea this Baptist from rural Georgia has helped spark this incredible industry that uh, employs thousands. And if I'm allowed to, from a Canadian standpoint, I hate to say this, but American beer's never been too good. <laughs> now, thanks to Jimmy Carter, uh, boy, uh, are there wonderful microbreweries all over. So, so that was one example. Right at the um, time, at at the time of his presidency, you, it was illegal to be a home brewer. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Carter, the scientist or rational person said to himself when he heard about it, he said, this is ridiculous. And um, I actually don't know if he's a beer drinker, but uh, even if he isn't, there should be pubs all over the North Country where they have a toast to Jimmy Carter with the beer some night. You know, <laughs> his and, brother was certainly a beer drinker. <laughs> yeah, Billy, uh, that was another thing I, I wanted to put in the book, which I did. The Carter family, like I just said, is just uh, it, what a group. You know, his mother was a nurse and provided equal health care to uh, African-Americans, which during that time was in that part of the world, you know, what st stood out. And um, and then another thing which is obviously well known about Carter is is when he ran for governor, he kind of. How do I put it? He kind of played both sides. But the moment he's elected, he says the time for racism is over. And that's never been heard of at that point. So um, he would hate hearing me say this. But um, I th think, I hope I'm wrong, that for the rest of my life, I'll never meet such a profoundly moral man. And I, as my journey with him and studying him has um, grown deeper and uh, over the years, I view him, I am less interested in the political Jimmy Carter than I first was, which is, you know, fascinating, of course. But his, uh, I read once something that has always stuck in my mind that Thanks to the personal interventions by Jimmy and Rosalind Carter over the decades, something like 70,000 prisoners of conscience have been released around the world. And another famous story, um, one of his assistants was in the room 
when President Carter met with the Pope, Pope John Paul. And the assistant said to a historian, watching the scene, it was tough to tell who was the politician and who was the religious figure. <laughs> He's uh, one of them, but just one of the most remarkable people of our time. Uh, and uh, I'm so one of the great honors of my life has to been to get to know him as a friend. And another thing, if I'm allowed to say, Mrs. Carter, um, she too is my hero, particularly with her work ongoing. Her work, she started in the 60s advocating for mental health reform and the lifting of stigma. It's, imagine, it's tough, tough enough today to face that stigma. And she was doing it in the 60s, in the early 60s. So she's a remarkable woman and a better politician than him. The other fun thing, if, if you want to hear one, they're great to watch bigger, just like every other uh, husband and wife. And they had a nice dust up at my house over dinner. And uh, they were, you know, just like your spouse and my spouse. And, you know, it was nothing serious, but it was a husband and wife thing. And he made his final point, and I wish I could do her accent, but Mrs. Carter just looked down the table and said, Jimmy, you can keep arguing, but you're still wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I can't let you go without asking how you happened to get Dan Aykroyd to blurb the cover of this book. Oh, well, uh, Dan Aykroyd lives here. Part, uh, Part of the year he lives in Kingston. I contacted him through a friend who had his email address and I swore I wouldn't give it to anybody. So I said, Mr. Aykroyd, you know, you'll remember playing Jimmy Carter on Saturday Night Live. And Mr. Aykroyd also produces his own wine and vodka. So I said, just wanted to tell you, I'm hosting President Mrs. Carter at my house here in Kingston. Maybe you wanted to send a bottle of your wine. And the day of, uh, this beaten up old car arrived, knocked on my door, asked if I was Arthur Milnes. And I said, yes. And the guy said, okay, Dan, Dan Aykroyd sent some stuff for you. So we went out to his trunk and there was a case of his red wine and a case of his skull head vodka. And uh, so I served the wine at dinner. So anyway, so same thing. I contacted Mr. Aykroyd and and asked if he would do a blurb uh, for my cover. And he came through in two days. And uh, like I said, it's, uh, I've never met him. (laughs) And, uh, but I owe him a great deal. Well, Arthur Milnes, I I appreciate it. Congratulations on the new book. And uh, let's talk again soon. Hey, my father always said the best, one of the best parts of being Canadian is living next door to such a wonderful, dynamic, and friendly people. And that's you guys. So uh, uh, thank you to all my friends and neighbors in New York State. That is a 2022 interview with Kingston, Ontario historian Arthur Milnes about his book that came out that year called 98 Reasons to Thank Jimmy Carter. The 39th president of the United States turned 100 this month. Now let's go to Ethan Shanty, our producer, with a look at who produces this show. Northwards is an NCPR podcast production. The show is written, edited, and produced by Mitch Tyke with digital production supervision by me, Ethan Shanty. Caitlin Kelly handles our social media. Bill Hanel is our digital director, and Doyle Dean is our production manager. Music is by the Wickmore Jazz Trio of Plattsburgh. To support this show and find more podcasts, visit ncpr.org. This is NCPR, North Country Public Radio.